course, it took me a whole lifetime, so to speak, to really come to the conclusion or have the, the, the great, the fundamental idea of what art is about. Art is humanities expressing, giving form, in what I mean by expressing, of their understanding of reality, of the moment. And reality is the wonderful Zen, old Zen definition of absolute reality is a circle without circumference where the center is everywhere. She is friends with Robert Rauschenberg, Bernard Leger, and Henry Moore. Her works hang in the Museum of Modern Art in New York and on the walls of the state legislature in Albany. She has received grants from foundations and the American Federation of the Arts. She has published four books, and her art has been exhibited in 35 one-woman shows. She has taught at the New School of Social Research, the Parsons School of Design, and the Brooklyn Museum of Art. She has just celebrated her 81st birthday and has been part of the avant-garde for over a half century. To Shari Deans, nothing is so humble that it can't be made into art. If you are really concentrating on looking for something, then you miss all the things that you are not looking for. It's a, like a... You know, you concentrate on wanting to find the particular thing that you want to look for. And the, all the unexpected will just not appear, you know. Oh, that's a nice one. That will make a nice necklace. Well, these are all found objects I find in the streets. Squishes, squashes, squishes. This is also quite nice. This might also make it. See, I make these magic breastplates that I, I make mostly out of found objects, or I have even some made of human bones that I got from the desiccator at NYU. I never look for anything. I'm just finding things. That's one of Picasso's sayings. And when I first heard that, I thought Picasso was... Uh, that was rather arrogant to say. Je ne cherche pas, je trouve. But now I realize that I was arrogant. I was a, just a young person. And I think that that's what I do. I'm just finding things. I was studying with um, Aux Enfants and Léger and Lot. And those enfants and Léger were, you know, together. They were, they had, it was very interesting because they had their, their, um, Léger came to criticize on Tuesday and those enfants came, came to criticize on Friday. And they were so fantastically, marvelously different. The one was very intellectual and the other was very, very, uh, psh, psh, psh. Leonora Carrington was, when she was 19 years old, she was working at the Ozan Falls School in London, where I was directress of the school. And we became very good friends. And then I met her, actually, when she and, and Max Ernst met, I think it was through me that she met Max Ernst, and then she lived with Max Ernst for two years in, in Paris. And then I, I was with them in the south of France once, Max Ernst and Leonora Carrington. Huh. 
In the 40s, I had shows at uh, Betty Parsons Gallery, and I think in the late 40s, Amade Ozonfon came to review my one of my shows, and and he 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 said he wrote it somewhere in a paper, or it was I think he was maybe it was on the radio that he said that that she has now the courage to to disregard all the everything that she knows in order to find out what she doesn't know anything about. And that's exactly what, what happened to me. It changed my whole whole attitude to to life and therefore my whole attitude to, to, to my artwork. And then it was only in the late 40s that I went to, I went out to the, to the Southwest that interested me most in America, that, that, what, what, what the, for, from the point of view of landscape and so on. And that experience of the landscape and what, went, what was going on in in the in that country changed my whole attitude to life a big black whale lies under the orange sky in thunderous sunshine the cactus gives no shade but mocks the monstrous whale stretching its prickly limbs skyward welcoming the heat and the bleaching vicious light An excerpt from the recent book by Christina Whale, The Women of Atelier 17, published by Yale University Press. She worked at the studio between 1949 and 1952. Deans befriended many Atelier 17 members and exhibited her prints regularly with the studio. Her prints are highly finessed featuring heavily encrusted passages of aquatint and deeply engraved markings produced with the scorper. They are largely abstract, with metaphorical references to the primordial unknown and personal transitions. Deans viewed the production of each print individually and consistently rotated the orientation of impressions pulled from the same plate. The experience of printing these highly textural plates spurred her interest in frottage. Starting in 1952, Deans began to make rubbings from nature, wood, bark, grass, and flowers, from man-made urban features, manhole covers, and subway grates, and from ancient petroglyphs. Besides the inspiration she drew from making prints, Deans experimental work in a neo-data aesthetic was also fostered through friendships with artists such as Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, John Cage, and Ray Johnson. Cage and Johnson shared her interest in Zen Buddhism. Plaster prints, a technique developed by Stanley Hayter and shown here in Shari's Composition and Sounds, a gift to John Cage dated 1950. A frame is made on top of a pane of glass and an inked copper plate is laid on the glass face up. Plaster is poured to fill the frame and then released by flipping it over. This early introduction to plaster leads to many experiments with plaster collage shown here at the Bonwit Teller windows 1955. 
I was at the summer before that, I was artist in residence at the Cummington School of Art in Massachusetts. And I had to go from my bedroom, I had to go to the, to the uh, dining room through a little old cemetery. And they had the most interesting uh, grave, grave stones, really just like Byzantine Madonnas and just beautiful. That's where I, I, that's where I started doing these, these, these what, the, what uh, Life magazine called uh, tombstone traceries, and it was actually it was the, the, uh, the title of that article was tombstone traceries. There was no explicit erotic body reference. There is no explicit uh, gender definition. It had a universal assumption. Oh, what else was just thinking about it? And in that regard, it relates more to fluxus, where um, explicit self depiction was considered um, incorrect. I don't think that um, the Buddhist premise would judge anything so harshly, but it relates to the rather harsh judgments of fluxus in terms of explicit sexuality, but also it relates to fluxus is a rather Zen sense of the permeation of presence and form and the vitality and life of the banal object when it's regarded intensively. Like you, you pay attention in all these disciplines, paying attention to what is, is um, a necessity, if not a demand, but it's a necessity. And that's where you build your great visual vocabulary and your vocabulary of uh, psychic connection. It's through the life of ordinary elements. And some are uh, man-made and many keep going back to nature. And I wanted to find some technique we could use I presented it as a problem to my friends who've been at Black Mountain and so on. And uh, MC did come up with the tombstone rubbing and said, Shari Deans is the person to see. I said, fine. Went to see her, and then went on from there. It seemed to be a continuation of the principle recently proposed on languages. Languages with the most phonemes, which include clicks and yelps and any, any other thing that's a part of a conversation are the oldest, the ones which have the fewest phonemes, which Polynesianism is one of the better examples, are the youngest languages to split. This is happening in the petroglyphs as well. The ones on the Columbia River, far more varied and, and interesting than the ones in Maine. But they still deal with the same basic concern with obtaining power from the spirits. And that means going for visions, out-of-body experiences, 
and at the very least, meditation. So we were left with rubbing from 350 surfaces. on a site which is about to be drowned, except for 48 surfaces which were bodily removed by the Army engineers. I was opposed to that. Because for me, the pet lifts don't make sense except in their original context. And you'll see that when you study the location they use for initiation. Shari would ensure that she got help doing the rubbings because she was doing them at three o'clock in the morning in the street and it was cold and it was windy and she needed people to help her. So she would enlist Bob, Bob Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, me and Sai Twomley and anybody else that she could get her fingers on to come out at three in the morning. We were all half asleep <laughs> and help her do her rubbings. And she wouldn't take no for an answer and we even never considered saying no because her behavior and her attitude and her presentation of herself was august. And so there was no question but that if she needed us, we would be there. And yet we were bad-mouthing her behind her back all the time and grumbling like crazy and yet doing it. And we loved her, you know, we grumbled, but we loved her. So I remember being on 6th Avenue at 3 in the morning with the wind and everybody holding down the rice paper over the manholes and Shari doing her rubbings and then picking up the paper that was almost flying out of our hands and rolling it up in cylinders and then everybody went home. So this was one of the things we did. But it was years later that I found out that she was dead because we hadn't been in touch. And it was a loss. It was a real loss because somehow with all this grumbling, I had really loved that woman and appreciated her and admired her. June 1st, 2011. Dear Miss Pollitt, thank you for your letter. I was able to visit the Shari Dean's exhibition last weekend and enjoyed seeing it. Some of the rubbings reminded me of the 1950s when after finishing my work at the bookstore on 57th Street, I used to visit Shari who lived nearby. After midnight, we would go out on 6th Avenue and she would work over the cracked street in various cast iron manhole covers. I was responsible for keeping the sometimes enormous sheets of fabric or paper that she used from blowing away. Best wishes, Jasper Johns. Bonwit Teller Window Displays, 1956, by Bob Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, supervised by Jean Moore. Jones and Rauschenberg often pulled work from friends for these displays. 
Shari was in correspondence with Jean Moore about her windows while she was on the West Coast. And it was around at that time that I got, I got, um, I got very much interested in Zen Buddhism, and of course after that, I went to 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 Japan to under to 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 live in a country, whether the Japanese realize it or not. But their whole culture is very much based on Zen Buddhism, and I wanted to live in a country where where that is. That is what's, what's based on. Yes, well, I knew that she told us that she had, she had just come back from Japan and where she did some incredible work. And uh, her, her studio had burned down and she lost much of her work. But then she was paid insurance and she took the money and went to Japan and stayed there for a whole year where she became very involved in Japanese life, especially with the artists. And at that time, she was very impressed with the fact that they didn't work so much alone as worked in groups. And that impressed her. And she also did some incredible uh, ceramics at that time and knew all the potters. And uh, also she studied calligraphy and she studied Zen. She actually went to temples and did uh, meditation. Her bottle sculptures rehearse for us that radiant void of which the sages speak. Forms press forth invisibly. The glass captures their reflection and we think we see multiple dwellings for a genie. Quiet seas for small ships, messengers from floating islands of light and color. Yes, and I would go there. Now I remember she would bring me in. She was working a lot with glass then. A lot with beautiful broken glass found stones and different kinds of bottles and cups and plates and they were assemblage. Yes, I loved them. They must have been quite influential if we see what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah, you have quite a few boxes with broken mirror and glass in yeah. and they're, they're very similar to things that Shari made so I wonder if that was a direct influence. I think it was a direct influence that I absorbed so fast I stopped saying I must have seen it there first, but now I remember the delicious tactility of all those materials she had, and that was the case in all the history of her work as I would come upon it. Now I'm remembering the glass, yeah. And also another uh, art life space that was completely defined by herself and what she was making. So you never thought of her as a mother or a mistress or an adjunct. She was her unique uh, warrior self, just with permission to keep making and creating what she needed to see. And that impressed me, no end over time, sure. Yeah. I think my work with the mirrors was very significant. That's the even lower. When is this? Oh, I've worked for years in the, with these mirror, what I call mirror brocages. You know, the, you know, you have seen those things upstairs and so on. Well, I don't know when it was, because. Um, uh, For many, many years, when I was a young woman, I had a feeling that I was just a, a reflection of all the people and all the things that are in the world. 
I am reflecting. And I'm not really, I'm a sort of a, a reflecting image. of an old dustpan and some feathers and a little, what is this called, the little music box. It's a funny little. Come on. It's will, it will only play when it when it feels like it. James Britton, Art of the City of Rock and Roll, San Diego Point, 1957. In regard to reviewing Shari Deans at Betty Parsons Gallery, her most amazing work to date is a painting 66 feet long, three and a half feet wide, which no eye, not even the artist, has ever seen all at once. For her latest New York show at Betty Parsons, 66, or From Sea to Sky, was set up as a labyrinth into which one threaded his way like a guest of old Gnosis. Long before the end was reached, the beginning had been lost sight of. Thus, 66 functions on the level of music or poetry since the senses cannot experience direct contact with all parts of the picture at a single sweep. To begin with, at one end of the lanky painting, there is an element the artist calls the seed. This she generated by getting intimate with the sawn end of a great double tree trunk. The remainder of 66 took the viewer through a spectrum-like book of changes. Colors ranged wildly and textures kept evolving their own ways of life. Often effects were obtained by the ink rollers picking up messages from something or another underneath the tissue. It might be strands of grass or twigs or string. The transition from natural material to man-made doesn't jar. Everything in its ghost likeness has a common quality of rediscovered phenomenon. Even wrinkles in the paper, when smoothed out after being inked, exhibit a tremendous charge of stress and strain, basic forces of nature. Then from Art News, this was written by Parker Tyler. From sea to sky, a scroll 22 yards long synthesizes Miss Dean's fastidiously Catholic art by being a symbolic narration rather than an imitation of natural objects. However, in her collages, which resemble heavy embroidery, the artist actually incorporates petals, leaves, other parts of plants, and even fauna. By fragmenting and veiling the object, or by desymmetrizing it and resymmetrizing it, she makes it seem to disappear 
into the pictorial dimension. So the collages make a kind of magic realism, but in reverse. The object is present, but seems unreal. Art News, October 1959, review by Lawrence Campbell of Shari Deans at Betty Parsons. Shari Deans has been away from New York until last winter for three years on the West Coast and in Japan. During this time, she has passed through a new creative cycle. She pushed rubbing techniques to their extremes and with them cast a spell of grays and blacks which pale and glow as a wind in the chimney fans the flames. I certainly remember 57th Street, absolutely. It was just a big, it was big, open, and the north windows and north windows onto 57th Street, I think, and it seems like one of the great piles of paper were there, another was over there near the smaller tent and the bigger tent there. The windowsill was, you know, butter and bread and sort of European feeling too how you could live like this. I probably read that that's how artists could live in Paris. Well, it was revelatory. I didn't, I could have sort of dreamt that a woman could live like this in her art, and her art as her life, and her life as her art, and her domestic uh, demands reduced to a window so with slightly spoiling milk and cheese. Uh, so that she would wake up and see her work and think about the work and go through her dailiness, making that in connection to her work. And Shari prepares me certainly for Dada, uh, aspects of European artists. She's a bridge, she's a threshold for me because no one else offers that. Reverie. Thrust your head through the tiny window. Breathe in deeply the wet and limpid air, striking the right spot with the right nose, floating through air you will spin, touching the wings of birds, stroking the feathery beings of ferns, reaching every corner of the courtyard. Inside the room you are lying on the couch, telephoning for your groceries. Wondering how the violets on your table have large, round, strong, dark leaves to hide their heads under, but not their scent.
Art News, 1972. A review by Lawrence Campbell of a show of Lily Enty, Louise Nevelson, and Shari Deans at Bucher and Harpsichord. Deans has been an original talent for eons and anticipated almost everything Robert Rauschenberg ever did, and possibly also Joseph Cornell, at least in terms of technique and experimentation. In this show, there are examples of Dean's collages of rubbings, her use of poignantly emotive fragments, like leaves and dead birds, enables her to transcend what, at least for her, were the limitations of painting. She has also carried the art of frottage to hitherto undreamed of heights. The show even contains a rubbing of Ray Johnson's face. Because their simultaneity and contradiction is always structurally harmonized, and that's also something that Shari does. Yeah. yeah. Taking the banal, the ordinary, and then giving it a sublime dynamic, that was, I recognized that, yeah. Uh, could say I've been a student of hers for many years just being in, uh, a good friend of hers and perhaps someday when I am uh, as young as she is I will have a, a similar amount of energy and discipline. Now I would like to just play a little bit of music for Shari on my instrument, the Gu Qin, which is the ancient Chinese lute instrument I've been playing for a little while, and uh, it was featured in our sounding of the I Ching concert. Last night. 
the last night, last year, whenever you see this, it was in the past. I've done many, many things with her, and always with this uh, warmth, and as you said earlier, vitality, uh, constant energy, flow of energy is amazing, and even at her present age. But I've never seen her uh, actually working on a work of art. And I don't know quite how she does it, but she uses such a wide variety of materials and she probably needs, her, her mind is open to, to possibilities that uh, she's, so you, you might almost say hunting for, like hunting mushrooms. She's hunting for other things to do than she has done. And she's interested in, in uh, and all experimentation. So she probably needs a lot of room. I don't think she would uh, hesitate Uh, I don't want to go too far, but I, I was going to say she, she wouldn't hesitate unless it was absolutely necessary before some experiment. Mm? That's true. Don't you think? Yes. <laughs> and uh, that's, I somehow connect that with the religious spirit. Uh, she, uh, as I have too, uh, became early involved with Oriental uh, thought. And there, apart from Oriental thought, I, I came to know of the philosophy of uh, George Herbert Mead, 
who was part of what was called the Chicago School of Philosophy. And he made a marvelous um, text, which I don't know by heart, about the religious spirit. And I think it, it, it brings, Shari brings that to mind. He said that uh, when one is born, that one feels that he's part of one family and separate from the other families. Hmm? But that as you grow older, uh, you, you think that you're in a neighborhood, separate perhaps from other parts of the same city. And when you get still older, you think you're in the, a whole country, maybe separate from other countries. And then when you feel no separation, Mm -hmm. from anything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you have the, then is, is the beginning of the religious spirit. And I think that this, this, um, Shari brings this to mind. Because in her experimentation, for instance, she wouldn't hesitate. She wouldn't feel, oh no, I mustn't do that. Mm -hmm. She would, she would try it. But a great deal of the work has, has um, stone or glass or pottery or textiles or paper. One of the, I think, uh, if there's any difficulty in relation to society of, for the use of her work, it's because she makes the work but never, never, very rarely takes trouble to, to frame it. It again has to do with this religious spirit. She doesn't want to separate it, I think, mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. by means of a frame. You know what beauty is. Mm -hmm. it, beauty is simply the acceptance of what one, you say something's beautiful if you accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, Wittgenstein noticed this. He said, uh, when we, the word beauty has n d no meaning. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it just means that we like, we, we accept it. Mm -hmm or it clicks, and he said, wouldn't it be better to have a clicker in your pocket so that when something didn't click, you would take it out and transform it, you see, by clicking it. And Shari doesn't need that, that clicker, mm -hmm. because as you just said, she, everything she sees mm -hmm. is, is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she makes herself um, very uh, beautiful. How old is she now? 87. Isn't that marvelous? And uh, she looked uh, fully as beautiful as the American flag the, the other day when I saw her, her white hair, you know. Okay. And she, there was something very blue and something very uh, red. And they were not just any old red or blue. It was, well, I say any old. Uh, I'm sure any old red or blue would have looked beautiful with her white hair. I don't think you have to um, stop at any point in, in Shari's work. I mean, the work moves right out into the line. Her experience knows no limits. Why? Why is it that? Well, it's this religious spirit. And I think she was early, uh, early caught by it. The third meeting was at the Elaine de Kooning studio, and we had about a hundred people. And Shari was a member of that group, too. And in the end, we decided to meet with all the um, powers that be at the five museums in the New York area. We wrote letters, and we made, we made uh, arrangements to meet with them, saying that we wanted to, we wanted to have a show of women artists. And um, we also decided that we'd have to demonstrate in order to get it. So we had one, one of our members was Irish. And so she went to the police station and got them to close off 53rd Street for our demonstration. And we decided that our demonstration wasn't going to be 
like men's demonstration, you know, going around being threatening. We were going to have a joyful celebration and also protest at the same time. She also was a member of AIR, uh, Shari was, which was the first women's uh, co-op gallery. And um, she had many shows there. But my favorite show was one that she had in which she had sound pieces and things with animal bones. And that was an incredible show. Really groundbreaking. I mean, it was nothing like it had ever been shown before. And I, I'm afraid that it, it didn't really get uh, the tremendous attention that it should have. Do you feel now, because you are the age of the century, that gives you more dignity in the eyes of male artists, that you've been freed of some degree of contempt that might be directed towards younger female artists? I don't, I don't, so I don't think in those terms, you see. But the fact, but it is, it makes a difference. The fact uh, that I survived gives me a certain um, standing, not because I am more successful or uh, more better known, but just the fact that I survived is, it seems to have a, seems to have a, a quality. People think that that's a, you know, but um, I very much believe, um, with uh, Gertrude Stein said that in one of her books, that we never think of ourselves any particular age. Once we grow up, uh, we just are. Whether we are 18 years old or 80, it's the feeling is identical. Am I in this time? You are. The feathers and all. <laughs> the, what were they, the, the plastic things that went up with uh, Dee Dee Halleck? The, the zilch. The zilches. Tell that. That's an incredible story. Dee Dee Halleck's a filmmaker, right? Uh, Who's a well, friend of this Shari's, is, uh, too. I'd call a teenage prank in that, uh, in the winter, when it was the bitter cold, she would have the zilch party at her house in their garden, and it would be the, the depth of January, February, and she'd call, have a, a dinner party or something, and everybody would have, bring uh, plastic laundry bags that very film uh, dry cleaner bags. Dry cleaner bags, that kind of gooey plastic that's just sheet, simple sheet. And then she'd show how you, t you tie a series of dots and then you get a big string out of each one. Then we'd go out hanging out on the trees. And when it was dark, um, we, you light the bottom uh, with a lighter <laughs> on the plastic and, it, and it, it, it burns, but it bubbles and it hisses and then it drips and makes a particular the, the hot bubbles as it hit the air, and then it hit the, the it hit the stone. It sizzles, and and we all sit around. And, wow, and this is here. Where's the tequila? <laughs> I mean, Mashari was not a drug uh, aficionado, or didn't need marijuana or LSD and all the stuff that was <laughs> well, typically how people see some stuff like that. She always oh, that marvelous. Oh, let's make some more. And we sit around. And, of course, this is highly toxic and highly dangerous. <laughs> and when the spring come, we'd have to kind of clean up the carbonized plastic that was getting in the way of the flowers. Toxic. And stuff. Yeah, it was very toxic. It was a baby made of time.
And I used to have ear in a lot, so I would think I had seen her at some point there, because I used to cherish what they were doing. It was the, the best uh, base for all of us. I won't even call it alternative, it was base, basic. What was the atmosphere like there? Oh, it's just heaven. You know, first of all, it's old, we like that. It's not uh, slick and modernized and uh, it's Rip's vision of how we can all gather and coalesce and present things. It's very flexible. It has a big open upstairs wooden sort of presentation area. Downstairs you can drink and eat. Um, it was just the best place to go. But anyway, I, you know, I was with a, a bit of a rolling circus of friends and visitors and the ear in in the upstairs apartment was always a, full of visitors or roommates. I mean, we had six, eight people living up there sometimes. And, but Shari had the main bedroom. When she wasn't there, other people would use it, but uh, she was the roommate there for 15 years until she was too ill to come and hang out and go to see things. And the house goes on, but without her, we would have all been evicted back in... 77. 77 is when she... Signed up Harry, paper. the old owner of the bar, who was Hungarian, would, in spite of the objections of the curmudgeons sitting at the stools, he'd call her to the back room. She wasn't allowed to sit in the front room or at the bar at all, but he would, they'd gone on in Hungarian. And that's how it happened, is that Harry, who wanted to sell and retire, he was a refugee from Hungary, just like Shari. And Shari, and at one point he said, why don't you buy it and, you know, put these young guys to work, which is what happened. She made a deal and we were suddenly uh, cooking and cleaning and serving downstairs, and then it's gone on since that. But without her willingness to do that, it wouldn't have happened. Shari and I did quite a few performances together. I just pulled out the poster of the Dharma Music Festival where she performed her I Ching mm -hmm. casting and uh, singing of it while I played mm -hmm. Chinese lute and I think Alan Zimmerman on percussion. There's a film in it somewhere. No! 
working with the strings uh, was inspired by, uh, by the new theory of physics, the theory of strings of the universe, the theory of the super strings of the universe. I've been working with strings for quite a while, making, putting bones and glass and so on on strings, and now I thought I would make a, a whole whole composition of the of strings and threads to be that was inspired by the theory of the strings. Nineteen eighty six Lawrence Campbell's essay on Shari Deans for her Thorpe Intermedia retrospective. I knew her first in nineteen thirty eight through a friend who was also her friend. I visited her in London in nineteen thirty nine, just before the war began, when the newspapers were filled with the news of the latest frontier crossed by German armies. She was at work on a large black painting. This impressed me deeply, although being quite then new to art, I couldn't pretend either to be able to fit it into any preconceived order, or to be able to tell myself that I understood what she was doing. But after all, is it ever really possible to understand anything in the world? Yet I received an emotional message, and that memory left its own memory behind. So I see that large black painting still, it seemed then sensationally modern, and that's the way I still think of it, and also of everything that she has done since. Shari Dean seems to have long ago mastered a discriminating sense of what lies beyond what we consider as attainable by the five senses. I know no one more truly liberated, and yet at the same time more practical, more sane, more in touch with reality. You look like you've handled a baby. <laughs> Not too often. <laughs> so we're here now with Shari and her friend Jasper Johns and baby Adrian. Yes. He's two and a half months. <laughs> Very chatty, hasn't he? Absolutely. He's telling you all about it.
just a human being. Just like my definition of an artist is, an artist is just a human being, only more so. <laughs> being a little more aware of, um, of, uh, of things in general, I think. There was one thing that I'll never forget when I discussed once many years ago uh, the fact, I mean, the position of women painters or women artists with uh, Bob Rauschenberg. And uh, I pushed him into a corner, and, um, and uh, he finally said to me, well, Charlie, I do, I have to admit that I would look at your work very differently if you were a man. I'm not going to explain. That whole box is a self-portrait. Um, I'm just leaving that and making it for you. Oh, she didn't become Robin Evans. So. Jesus Christ. As they used to say on the uh, Grand Central Station radio stories, uh, Grand Central Station, a, mil a mil million different lives and every life a story. Um, every life a story. That was the most important thing for me to have to have um, become aware of that this right and wrong and me and the other 
doesn't exist really. To check out whether, whether I can accept myself or whether I can approve of my concept or somebody should approve of my ideas uh, was just completely, uh, I don't function that way, let's put it that way. All right, if somebody approves of it, it's fine. If, even if I, I'm not even really interested, I'm not really interested in it, whether I myself approve of it, you know, fundamentally. One looks at the work of Shari Deans and gets the feeling that history is one of the materials she works with. Her research embodies a slow and constant evolution, always branching from a single trunk or one brick after another, starting from foundations and building towards a roof. Her life itself is the site where she raises this construction and the house she has managed to build is something more than simply outlandish it's one of those solid, classical structures like the ones we admire from antiquity and that no one today could repeat. Gazamkin's work, with all the fascination of great simplicity, as is always true of the most important and moving works of art. She walked through life and confronted everything. She would talk with everyone. Her eyes never wandered away from somebody's face. And whether it was a cab driver or somebody selling hot dogs on the street, Shari felt that her role in life was to engage. And 
if there's anything that someone sees in the context of this show here, it is that she saw the magic in everything and everybody. You know, Shari's legacy may be this art on the wall, but Shari's legacy is also in the many acolytes whose lives that she touched and whose concept of the world and concept of things in it are based on their exposure to her. Shari, we miss you. At the time I met Shari, I had not done visual art. It was during the time I knew her that I started doing visual art and showing at galleries and museums. And uh, so it was, uh, she was really an example uh, for, uh, you know, beginning person in that world. And she was terribly encouraging uh, to all of us. Our impact is what a courage, what an independence, what a pathfinder, and what a courageous human being disguised as a woman. I know a lot of people say she's a dervish, she was you know, a witch, she was a sorceress. She was impossible, she was very possible. She was um, compromising anyone's values, if you know what I mean. She would slide down her elbow at a young man's chest and say, don't you want to give me a ride back to Rockland County? So she had her ways to play with her age group and her independence. So uh, this was another remarkable fact. She took herself very seriously, but by the same token, she also so laughed about herself. And uh, on the other hand, she would never let anyone question that she was a true warrior for the arts. I think it's very important to be present in the moment, to be able to observe, more or less as a journalist, some action or some object and take that into your art. And the act of annexing something from the world temporally and physically, um, that is the Shari Dean's approach. I noticed here that her very early work was very finished, it had a lot more intentionality. And I think the older that she got, the more she connected with nature and began to see the flow of nature. The flow of nature is very important to my work. I work entirely with soundscapes, public events, broadcasts, the, the immaterial. So the intersection between Shari's work and mine is the intersection between solid objects and things that make sound that you can't see. And of course, that intersection is the spirit. I met Shari when I had um, my first dance company. And I was working with Kei Take, uh, who's quite a character for herself, <laughs> about that high. Um, and we went up to her, uh, the second floor, and she went through some of her trunks, and she said, I'm going to find things. She didn't know what the piece we were doing. It, it actually was uh, a, a kind of uh, Japanese-American collaboration. I can't even explain it. And she found things in her trunk. Uh, she found corsets, old-fashioned lace-up corsets, and she said, you must use these as masks. <laughs> and then she said, now I'm going, to give, I'm going to tell you how to make Kay's costume. And she took grave rubbings, and she said, you cut a slit this way and this way, and you put it over her head, and that's her costume. And then she designed something for me, you will appreciate this, and, and said, you cut three circles of cloth, and so one down here and one up here and one over the neck like that. So we, we had these costumes and we went into dance theater workshop uh, 
and she was going to make the set for us. And she decided that we should have lights on the wall and water dripping. <laughs> <laughs> we almost got thrown out of <laughs> But the set was wonderful. The costumes were wonderful. The first night we performed, it was on a table, and we had a lot of candles. I think that was Shari's idea, too, the candles. Uh, Kay's costume caught on fire. <laughs> and I had to go over and beat her. <laughs> And Kay was like this. And finally, she stopped and she realized what was happening. And she said, Erin, thanks for help. Thanks for help. Thanks for putting the fire out. Oh, thanks too much. She was wonderful. Boulevard Beach Coma, Village Voice, 1956. If you wandered along the street or beach picking up interesting looking pieces of junk and put them on show at Mills College in an exhibition which opened last week, your name could only be Shari Deans. The exhibition is called Objet Trouvé and Miss Deans is called Unconventional by some and a true artist by Mills College professor Leon Smith. The objects have color, texture, and pattern, as well as mystery and magic. They connote feelings of times past and places seen and experiences had. They bear heavily on recall and sharpen the awareness of beauty and rhythm in the world around us, in the words of Dr. Smith, to whom I was speaking before Miss Dean arrived. A tall, graying lady of Hungarian birth, she spends much of her time kneeling on city sidewalks taking rubbings from gratings and manhole covers. About five o'clock on Sunday mornings is the best time, she says, because there aren't as many hecklers and traffic is light. I take those big sheets of paper that photographers use, but I have to keep a firm hold or they blow away. Sometimes I take rubbings of cracks in the sidewalk, and sometimes I take rubbings of rubbings. The Mills College Exhibition, 7th Floor, 66 Fifth Avenue, contains 1. A rusty garbage can lid, considerably battered. 2. Chips off a pine cone, which look like ducks in a pond. 3. A mannequin's leg in a whiskey bottle topped with a seashell. 4. About one-third of a shovel, which looks like a bird. 5. An automobile hubcap dented by passing trucks. Six innumerable pieces of well rounded charred driftwood, burnt orange crates, and scorched easels. And seven, an enormous sheet of rusted metal. Quote, we had to cart it home in a taxi, which resembles a map of ancient Egypt. In her uptown studio, Miss Deems keeps two other prized specimens a fish tank full of empty bottles and the skeleton of a horse she found in New Mexico. It was too big to keep intact, she says, so I attached the ribs to the light cord above my head. 
Even when I'm a little bleary, I can always find the light because the bones rattle when you bump into them. Like me, 